I'm really excited uh, to get into this today. Uh, so this is our in the file game UI prototyping with the prototyper plugin. Uh, I've seen this presentation already and I am super stoked. Um, I'm Jake Alba. I'm a developer advocate here at Figma. My pronouns are he and they. Uh, and uh, I, I am really excited uh, to kick things off here. So I'll hand it over to Ashray, who's going to get us started. All right, awesome. Mic check. Hey, everybody. We I'm Ashray. Um, I'll take over screen share now, Jake. Great. Cool. Just one second. I'm getting all the Zoom stuff out of the way. So, hey, everybody. Uh, welcome to Game UI Prototyping with Prototyper. Um, I'm Ashre, and my pronouns are he, him. And uh, today, I want to give you all a peek at what it takes, uh, what goes into designing uh, or and prototyping game UI, some of the design principles and constraints that we work with, and how um, you can create these prototypes in Figma. Um, and finally, you know how plugins like Prototyper can really speed up those workflows. So before we jump into it, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. Um, so I am a UX designer, um, currently a UX designer on Fortnite at Epic Games. I um, got into UX because I'm really passionate about problem solving. But what I didn't expect is that I would also become really passionate about solving problems for other designers and you know not just the users we create fun features for. So as I got into the space and I started exploring the designer problem space, I found a lot of workflows that we do in our daily work, right? That are um, that can be optimized, that can be improved. Prototyping is one such workflow. There's a lot of repetition in it, um, which I'll show you later today. And what I found is plugins that are tailored to the experience of prototyping can like drastically cut down the amount of time it takes. So um, in doing that, plugin development became really fulfilling to me and I started pursuing it more and more. Um, some of the plugins that I've made that um, Prototyper we're going to look at today, but also Radial Generator, Is This a Meme, and Desaturate. These are some of the ones I'm, I'm really proud of and I use often in my own daily work. Um, and outside of work, like games have been a very cornerstone hobby for me. I've grown up playing a lot of games. Uh, I have many favorites. Some of them are on screen now. But um, just to be in the games UX space feels kind of incredible because I get to create these fun features as a designer, but experience them as a player. And then I turn around and I get to help other game UX designers become more efficient at their work through some of the plugin work and other things that I'm doing. So I'm really grateful that I get the opportunity to do, to do that. So um, jumping into the deck, today we're going to look at primarily three things, right? First, we're going to take a look at tons of examples of game UI scattered throughout this deck at different points. We'll look at different games, we'll look at different navigation structures and sort of different patterns that emerge in game UI. And the idea is to um, immerse ourselves and just experience how different game UI is from what you're used to on web and mobile, but also how different games are from each other. There's a lot of diversity in this space, and it's kind of like the wild, wild west when it comes to UI design. So I want to give everybody a taste of that. Next, we'll take a look at some of the navigational constraints and characteristics that emerge in game UI. And um, once we understand these, right, we'll be able to use them and apply them to uh, prototypes, which we will make towards the end of this talk. We'll jump into a slew of prototyping demos. I'll show you how to both create game UI prototypes with Figma, and then also with the help of plugins like Prototyper. Um, and we'll also take a look at some of the cool bulk prototyping capabilities that Figma has recently introduced. So with that said, let's jump in and then look at some game UI. We'll start with one of my favorite games, um, Halo Combat Evolved. This came out in 2001, it's a classic. Um, it is the first entry in the Halo franchise, and the this we're looking at the main menu right now. So when you get past all the videos and stuff, you land on this screen, and it has a simple vertical menu. You can pick uh, what option you want and sort of go play the game from there. And um, to contrast against this, right, 
This is Halo Infinite. This is the latest entry in the Halo franchise coming out 20 years later from the first one. And you'll notice that we still have some of the same elements. You still have your simple vertical menu, which lets you choose how you want to play the game. Um, but there's also a lot more going on. So I'd like to briefly touch on that. First, we have this global top nav. Um, and this creates four different tabs, which are four distinct sort of UI experiences for this game. Play lets you choose how you want to play the game. Customize lets you change how your character looks. If you bought a specific item, you can equip it and other sort of player identity related things. Um, community lets you browse community maps and other things that players are enjoying or they're sharing with the community. And finally, the shop lets you buy items. Um, this is just one element, but there are others here as well. There is a Battle Pass promo. Um, for those who are unfamiliar with a Battle Pass, it's basically a reward, a way to reward continuous play. So as you play the game, you level up your Battle Pass and you unlock rewards. Um, so there's a way to access that real quick, and it shows you some other information like your level and what season you're playing. There is a news carousel. And then finally here at the bottom right, there are some uh, functions like settings, uh, friends list, and so on and so forth. These are persistent, and you can trigger them from anywhere on the screen. Um, but this is just one tab. Let's take a look at the shop tab now, and we'll see that this is a complete departure of layout. This tab looks completely different and navigates completely different from the play tab. So even within the same game, you can have very diverse looking screens that have very different uh, navigation systems at play. Um, this is a staggered grid with large previews because the shop wants to show you the items you can buy and they want to make it as easy as possible. So the previews are big. You can very clearly see what you're getting. Um, and, and this drives home the point. Games are very diverse and you can't always uh, assume that screens will work the same way. So having looked at this example, if we think about navigation, um, I find that it helps to start in a familiar place. So when we think about navigation, let's start with the web, right? We're all used to websites. Um, it's a simple point and click interaction. Whatever you're interested in, just go and click that thing. Um, and that translates to mobile as well. On mobile, you can just tap or scroll and tap, if you will, if something is off screen. But essentially, your interaction is always a single tap on whatever part you're interested in. Um, and these are the typical characteristics of pointer-based devices. The, this ability to freely navigate UI, click anything, and then uh, have that open up something new, and then just repeat the process. These are very. Uh, these are the some of the best things about pointer-based navigation. Um, but a lot of games, and specifically the games we'll look at today, uh, don't have this ability. Console games in particular, the ones that work off of game controllers, like the PlayStation 5 controller here, um, are unable to point to things in a way a mouse cursor or your fingers can. And so what they do instead is they let you nudge uh, in a particular direction with the D-pad or the sticks. And these let you move in your typical up, down, left, and right direction, but you're unable to point now. So when we look at a UI like this, um, this is the inventory screen from Horizon Forbidden West. It's, it's a place for your character to view all the items or weapons and armor that they have collected over the course of the game and uh, equip them to different item slots. When we, when we look at an inventory screen like this, because you're unable to freely point and you can only move in certain directions, we see patterns begin to emerge. Games will often make use of gridded structures like the inventory grid here or simple vertical and horizontal lists because these cleanly map to directionality on the controller. Um, and I think for the, for, for, the, for the scope of this talk, right, it helps to examine um, controller-based games the most because we all kind of know how to prototype for mouse and keyboard. That's the space we're most familiar with, I think. But controllers are new, and game UI is incredibly specific for uh, controller design. So let's take a look at some of the characteristics that emerge because controllers cannot be pointing devices. And so one of the first characteristics is focus-based navigation. This simply means that instead of freely pointing at things, you have to start on a selected item 
And then your primary way of navigating a UI is to move that selection in whatever direction you're trying to go in. So in this example from Pokemon Legends Arceus, if you start here on the top left on the Pokeball and you want to go to the bottom right, you're going to have to press down two steps and then press right three steps. So each of these is a button press on the controller. And because it's a button press, it has an interaction cost. And we're asking our users now to pay this cost every time they want to navigate our UI. So it helps to make this as easy as possible for our users. So many games will implement things like if you hold a button down in a particular direction, they auto scroll and, and so on and so forth. But yeah, this is the primary space we're working with, right? Pointers don't exist. Everything needs to be moved manually. It's almost like you're pushing a boulder um, and you have to push it step by step. So um, all UX designers in this space are very cognizant of that effort. Um, but one of the interesting things about focus is you can begin to play with starting position. Starting position is important because when you arrive at any interface, the game needs to give you uh, a point to start from, from where you can start nudging and going in different directions. If the game doesn't do this, then you're confused. Like, where do I start? What will happen when I press one of these directional buttons? And so starting position is an interesting concept that you can play around with a little bit. Um, I find this example from Horizon Forbidden West very helpful. Um, so if you look at the top part of the screen here, you'll notice that we are currently on the map tab. And Horizon Forbidden West makes this decision for the player where when you press the menu button uh, to open the game menu, you always arrive on the map tab. And that's cool because they also placed the map tab in the middle. And what that does is it makes the other tabs closer and also equal distance away. So at most two clicks away in either side. If the map tab was the first tab in the list, then you can imagine notebook would have been four taps away and therefore less prioritized than say inventory and skills because of that interaction cost of having to press a button. So starting position lets uh, designers play with how close and how far things are and therefore create sort of this relative priority or hierarchy of importance in game UI. Um, and another great example of starting position is uh, store pages for games. Um, games are businesses and they all need to make money. Uh, and many live service games have stores in, uh, in the game UI that let you buy cosmetics or special packs or other things that they can use to you know, give you value and then also make a little money and sustain themselves. So store pages often will put the most uh, lucrative or the, the best selling uh, item as the first item you navigate to. So in this example from Killer Instinct, the best deal, which is the Killer Instinct Definitive Edition, happens to be also be the first tile. So that's perfect, right? You land on this screen, you're already selected on what the developer thinks you are most likely to buy. You buy it and then you leave. It's a win-win for everybody, for the developer, for you as the user. It's a good experience overall. And you don't have to do a lot of navigation now. So um, this is a good way for developers to prioritize important things. And moving on, another thing that occurs when you think of focus-based navigation is, um, is because there is no path, there is no free form pointing anymore. You have to provide a path. And a path, if it's in a cluster, can give the user some sense of directionality of like, what direction am I going? How do I get from this point to the next? And um, this example from Skyrim is perhaps a little bit on the nose because I find it so apt that they use a constellation system for their skill tree, because a constellation is a cluster of stars with a defined path. It's just, it's perfect. This is, this encapsulates the point really well. But a clearer example perhaps is this screen from Darksiders Genesis, where this skill tree very clearly shows you the path you can take to navigate every node that's connected to it. It even shows you what tree, what skills are disabled and that you have yet to acquire by leveling up your characters. So if you started here in the middle, you know very clearly you can go left, down or right. And then each of those trees in turn gives you the path you can follow. So 
it's a great way to remove ambiguity of navigation, make things easy for your users. They don't have to spend any more time thinking about how to navigate your UI. They can just do it by looking. Um, a quick note on skill trees, in case anyone's unfamiliar, um, skill trees is just a way for games to, to say, hey, your character became stronger. They are able to learn a new ability or a new skill. It's like if you started doing blacksmithing, you would start here at this tree in the very center, which is level zero blacksmithing. And when you level up, you gain like a new skill, like you can make a, a hammer or something, right? So that's a new node on the skill tree every time you unlock an ability. So um, things sort of neatly fit clusters and paths, but sometimes they don't. Sometimes you have to rely on the global navigation layer of a game. And the lobby from Apex Legends is a good example of this. Um, I ask you to find uh, what you think is a cluster of navigable like sort of nodes here. And personally for me, I can't, right? I can't find one. Everything seems to be off on the edges. Uh, there's no central sort of grid or list that I can navigate. And that's because the lobby has a lot of things to do. The lobby reserves the central place for player outfits and your party. Uh, or rather player representation. And so Apex Legends makes the decision of using global navigation to navigate all parts of its uh, lobby UI. We start here at the top where you have a set of tabs that can be navigated with the L1 and R1 buttons on your controller. So those are these buttons, the shoulder buttons on a PlayStation controller. Um, and they navigate these top level tabs. Here at the bottom right, we have uh, dedicated button binds for every single uh, one of these functions, things like settings, the friends list, so on and so forth. And then to begin playing the game, there is a big old triangle button bind next to ready, which if you press, you will begin to matchmake and find a game to play in Apex. So global navigation fills in the gaps where your typical focus-based uh, navigation uh, it like leaves out those gaps that it leaves out. It fills in the spaces in between. And together, they make a system that allows you to navigate games efficiently with enough direction and very low ambiguity. So now that we understand some of these principles, um, let's take a look at what it what goes into prototyping a focus-based navigation UI. And we'll come back to our inventory from Horizon Forbidden West and we will, we will prototype a gray box version of this first in Figma, and then I'll switch over and show you to how to do it with Prototyper. So switching over to the file now, um, here we have our gray boxed inventory. Our goal for this prototype is to uh, essentially make it so the user can navigate these slots, the ones in the lighter gray. The, the dark gray slots, for the sake of our example, let's assume they're disabled. And so the user cannot navigate them. So I'll begin. Um, I'll begin by duplicating this mockup for to rep to basically replicate this tile structure, right? So I'm going to option click and drag, create the first row. Option click and drag again, create the second row, and then option click and drag, create the third row. This loosely represents uh, the tile structure. Um, and this will become, it'll become clear why I'm doing this in just a moment. So if we start here on the top left frame, if this is our starting position, when we move right, we have to make it so the next tile is focused and the previous tile is unfocused. So you can imagine these screens each representing one step you take in the, in the prototyping, uh, in the prototype we will create, right? And so we can move focus over by one every time. Um, and you can imagine what it would look like for the other screens as well. So I'll skip over that part now, but do take note that I had to duplicate these screens and I had to do the same step essentially for each one of them. Next, we'll take a look at how you can define prototyping interactions. Because while we have created the states we need for our prototype, right now there is no interactivity. We have not made it so that the prototype will react to button presses. Um, so fun fact, if you connect a controller to your computer via Bluetooth, Figma can pick up uh, those uh, controller button inputs directly. And so what I can do now is select a frame, click this plus icon here at the edge, drag it to the next frame, and that represents a prototyping connection. 
And here in the interaction details modal, I can select key or gamepad and press uh, D-pad right to go one step to the right. On the flip side, I can come back here and drag another noodle and press D-pad left. Take note that I have to press these buttons on the controller every time. Um, so if you don't have a controller handy, you can't actually prototype um, this part of the UI. You, you need to have one connected, otherwise Figma will not read those inputs. And then I'm just gonna do this for one more set of frames, uh, connect them back and forth. So what did we do? We have taken a few repetitive actions. We've duplicated these frames, we moved focus, and now we're just gonna do this connection bit for every direction for every frame. And that's a lot of repetition, right? So let's not do it. Let's move on, let's do it with, uh, I'll show you how Prototyper works and I'll show you how it can automate uh, this workflow. So um, Prototyper is a plugin that I made. I've been developing it for about two years now, uh, almost two years. And it comes from the knowledge that I've sort of gained after doing way too many manual prototypes uh, for games, like very complicated ones. I, I would spend hours on them before. And I wanted to create a better way to do this, a more tailored way to game UX prototyping. So Prototyper is the result of those efforts. And it does two things primarily. First, you can give prototype or a single frame with um, some components inside that have a way of representing focus. So in the previous prototypes that we saw, the tiles had a focused property. I'll, I'll show this again later. But you're essentially able to turn focus on and off. And from there, Prototyper can generate a full prototype from the grid or the vertical or horizontal menu that you give it. Um, and it can create this whole prototype for you. So you save a ton of time here. But this is fairly automatic, right? You have to give it a single frame. Prototyper has to understand everything and then make those make the prototype for you. There's also a slightly more manual mode that gives the designer more control. Let's say you are the designer and you have created these three screens um, and you've designed the screens yourself. Uh, so for each of these screens, you've designed it, you have managed the transition. Here we're going from left to right and you have placed these on your Figma canvas. What Prototyper can also do is for any number of selected frames like these, it can just make the prototyping connections. So it lets you handle the design, you handle the transition Prototyper just does the repetitive task of connecting them into a prototype. So these are the two modes that Prototyper has. And what I'd like to do now is shift focus and let's build the same inventory prototype, but with the Prototyper plugin. So here we are. I'm going to begin by selecting uh, the nodes I want to create the prototype for. I will deselect this disabled node. Uh, I'm going to press command P, or I think it's control P on Windows to bring the command menu and run Prototyper from here. Here we are, the plugin's running. Uh, it's opened on generate by default. And um, what we want to do now is um, make sure that our controller and other things are set up correctly. So we want to navigate with the PlayStation controller, though you can also choose Xbox or Switch Pro, whichever one you have. We also want these tiles to be navigated with the D-pad. Um, Prototyper also has other sensible defaults, including custom binds, if you do want to create a custom navigation scheme. So we're just gonna leave it on D-pad. For our animation, we'll leave it at smart animate with 200 milliseconds. It's a pretty short, uh, sweet looking transition, but we'll leave it there. The only work we have to do is make sure we define how we wanna change focus properly. So I'll step aside into these tiles for just a minute. And you'll see that they have a focused property, which controls whether the tile is white or not, essentially denoting focus. So we wanna make sure that we feed those details into Prototyper so it knows how to adapt focus for each step of the prototype. So here under variant property, I'm gonna type focused. In the from value, which is the deselected value, I'll type no, and the to value, I'll type yes. These don't have to be no or yes, and this property doesn't have to be focused. They can be whatever values you have created for your design system, right? So it, it kind of works with your existing tooling. You don't have to change anything for Prototyper. And um, this is the fun bit. I'm gonna click generate now. And there we go. Uh, there is a full prototype ready and waiting. 
Um, and we'll step into it just to make sure it works properly. And sure enough, it does. I'm pressing the D-pad buttons on my controller. And um, notice that we can navigate to any node. There is no linearity. I don't have to follow a specific path or do anything like that. This works as it would in game. So that's the first thing, right? But let's push a little bit more. Um, let's assume our game has three unique tabs. And I've kind of based this off of other games that I've played. So the skill tree comes from God of War 2018. Fantastic game, highly recommend. The quest screen comes from Horizon Zero Dawn. And I've kind of loosely mocked them up so that we're dealing with realistic examples of game UI and not make-believe. So these three tabs, um, I would like to make it so that we can switch between these tabs with the shoulder buttons on our controller. That's a very common interaction pattern in games for sort of global navigation. We saw this both in Apex Legends and uh, Halo Infinite in our own examples just now. So I'm going to start by selecting the frames. I will switch to the link tab in Prototyper. Under navigation, I will switch to shoulder buttons instead of D-pad, and I'll click link frames. So there we go. Prototyper makes those connections really fast, and we'll start hop into our prototype here, um, and we can switch tabs, sure enough. Um, this is great, but right now our inventory and our tabs exist as separate prototypes. So why don't we make it so that you can do both in the same prototype, right? Browse the inventory and generally the contents of every tab, but also switch tabs. I'm going to start at the same step. So I'm just starting with these tabs already linked, which is what we did before. So it's just one step ahead. And then first I will just space these out a little bit more so that there is room for those new prototypes to be accommodated. I'm gonna come in here, select the inventory nodes. In Prototyper, I will go back to generate. I will click PlayStation, or rather for the PlayStation controller, I will use D-pad. Prototyper remembers all the focus details we entered earlier. So one of the things you can do is in your design system, make sure the focused property is named consistently. And so you never have to change these three things again, regardless of what component you use in your design system. It doesn't care if the components are the same. It only cares if the name of the property that you're manipulating is the same. So. I'm going to click generate and it'll generate the inventory prototype. We've already seen that bit, but the skill tree is interesting. It's not as symmetric a grid as the inventory. And for this one as well, we're actually not going to prototype these dark gray skills, right? For the sake of our game, let's assume our player hasn't unlocked them yet. They're not high enough a level to have gotten to these skills. So I've selected the ones I do want to prototype. And I'll zoom out and I'll click generate. So Prototyper will make these connections. Um, it is perhaps not as clean of a grid as this inventory, but Prototyper did still logically assign the directional inputs here. So when we navigate this, it will work as expected. Um, and since we've been doing a lot of these one node at a time transitions for the other prototypes, I thought it'd be fun to switch it up for the quests mockup. Here, instead of navigating one quest at a time, let's scroll the list. Um, so we'll see what that looks like. Looks like. I'm going to make uh, two copies of the quest screen for three in total. And then what I'll do is I will just scroll this list myself to a midpoint position in the second one. And then for the final one, I'll scroll it to the very end. Here. Um, and we need to adjust the position of the scroll bars. So. I'm just going to center align it here because it's in the middle position. And then here I will bottom align it with its container. Um, and so we've uh, created the frames. We've managed the transitions ourselves. All we need to do is connect them now. So we'll step back into link with prototyper. Um, I will go to, I will choose the right stick as my input method. So the right stick makes sense here because typically uh, the D-pad and the left stick on your controller are reserved for focus navigation. So one nudge at a time in one direction, typically. And the right stick is kind of a free input there to assign to scrolling interactions or other things. So we're just going to use the right stick. And um, I'll click link frames. And we'll see now that Prototyper has created this entire prototype. 
Um, and let's go here. We'll just quickly browse and see if everything works. And then we can also browse the skill tree. Again, this isn't a perfect grid, so navigation will jump around a little bit, but it's still going in the same directions that you're pressing the buttons for. And in quests, we can scroll our quests list. And this is still nonlinear. I can be on any node or any skill in any of these tabs, right? Any, any node and still be able to switch tabs. So we're still maintaining uh, game levels of fidelity, but with very little effort. At this point, I think we've spent less than 10 minutes creating these demos or about 10 minutes creating these demos. And I just wanted to call out. So when I was doing the manual prototype for this demo, I timed myself and it took me about 20 minutes to create this by hand with no mistakes. Um, we've spent less than half the time to create prototypes that are at least three times as complex, if not more. So um, this is just the power of a plugin that is, is tailored to that specific workflow. Um, but you know, you can combine Prototyper with some of the other bulk prototyping capabilities that Figma has to very, very interesting effects. So let's take the prototype we made before and complicate it a little bit. If we zoom into our inventory screen, we'll see that there is a sort items button here at the bottom, and that represents a global navigation action, right? You can take this action anywhere on the inventory screen. So why don't we add that? We'll add that to our inventory mockup. For that, I have a, a pre-made UI here. It's very simple. It just has a overlay, a 60% transparent overlay, and a simple menu with some sorting options. Um, what I'm going to do is because I want this to live in the inventory space only, I'll grab a copy of the inventory mockup. Any mockup will do. It doesn't matter which one you grab. I just wanted a copy. I will drag the sort overlay into this mockup. So it's inside now. I'm just going to center and zero it in that mockup. So it's perfectly positioned now. And it overlays the inventory container. Um, now, when we're in the sort menu, we don't want any other lingering focus from our previous screens, right? So we're going to select this inventory tile and we're going to unfocus it. And this makes sense. Ideally, your focus should only ever be in one place and not two places at once. That would be confusing for users. And so now we have the screen that we want, uh, but we don't have the prototype we want out of it. It's just the first position selected and the other ones aren't. Um, before we do that, though, let's take a minute to examine what kind of interactions we inherited because we copied the inventory mockup. Whenever you copy a frame, it copies all the interactions that were coming out of it. So this inventory mockup is still connected to a bunch of things. And we see that these things, they're just going back to different parts of the inventory prototype. While we are in the sorting menu, we don't want any of these other inventory prototypes uh, interactions to work. So I'm just going to drag across them and delete them. The only other interaction we have left is one is the one of switching tabs with the shoulder button. For the sake of simplicity, let's just assume our player can't do that either. When they open the sort menu, they are locked in the sort menu until they close it. So now we have a free frame, no interactions whatsoever. And so let's come in here and generate the sorting menu. So I'm going to go into Prototyper. Um, again, this is a frame uh, where I have the components made for me with the same properties I used last time. So I'll just hit generate. Uh, but before I do that, I will switch to the D-pad. Uh, it's very important to not forget to use the correct input method. Otherwise, you'll build the prototype and you'll have to undo it later to make sure your input methods are correct. So I switched to the D-pad, I hit generate, and there we go. The sorting menu now exists, but it's not connected to our UI. Like it's not connected to the inventory. There are no arrows going and connecting them, right? So first let's create the interactions which will open the sort menu from the inventory. So I'm gonna select all of the inventory frames uh, and I'm going to go back into the prototype mode in Figma. Um, you'll notice now that when all of this is selected, I can still drag arrows and it's, they're essentially bulk prototyping arrows because they're dragging it for all of the frames that I've selected. And I'm just going to connect it here to the first position of the sort menu. And while this is open, what I can do is I can select these arrows and 
I come in here into interaction details and when I select key and gamepad, I can press the key I want the uh, I want to use to trigger this. So I'm going to press square on the controller because that's the bind in our UI. We've created the transition to enter the sort menu, but we still need to create the transition to leave the sort menu. So for that, I will select all of the sorting, uh, all of the frames of the sort menu. Again, do the same thing, drag a noodle out, a bulk prototyping noodle and connect it to any inventory prototype. The choice doesn't matter. I've just done it here because it's convenient. Um, let's play this and I'll show you how it works. So when we press square, our sorting menu comes up. Oh, and it doesn't go away because what I didn't do was I didn't add the square bind here. So I'll, I've done that now. And now we can summon and sort of shoo away the sorting menu whenever we want. We can still navigate our inventory. We can also navigate the sorting prototype. But watch what happens, right? Let's say I scroll, let's say I scroll to the fourth position on the sort menu and I select it. And now I close the sorting menu. Um, it will reset its position to the first place. The same thing happens in the inventory. Let's say I'm on the first inventory position and I open the sort menu. And when I close it, I'll end up at the last inventory place. And that's expected, right? Like we didn't tell Figma to do anything different. This is what we told Figma to do and it's doing it. But the disconnect for the user is their preferences aren't being remembered now. And so what I want to show you now is how you can add statefulness to your prototypes in Figma. So we want to do two things. We want the sort menu to remember where it was, and we want the inventory to remember where it was uh, when we switch between and back and forth. So um, to do that, Figma has added sections uh, recently. They were in FigJam for a while, but they added it to Figma. And one bonus that you get out of sections in Figma is that they make your prototypes stateful. So they make it remember where they were. So I'm going to wrap both my inventory and my sort menu in sections. And that's because I want both of these things to individually remember their state, right? Um, I'm going to go back into prototyping mode. From the inventory, every, every sort of prototyping interaction that was coming directly to the sort menu screen now goes to the sort menu section. And from the sort menu, every interaction that was going directly to an inventory screen goes to the inventory section. And that's our way of saying, hey, Figma, whenever something goes to this section, just open the first frame. But then wherever the user left off, open that frame next. So it's a way to tell Figma to handle remembering where things were for us. I'm going to reset my prototype, and let's run this again. OK, so we're on this position in the inventory. And we're going to go to the fourth position in the sort menu. And when we close the sort menu, we come back to the same position on the inventory and we come back to the same position in the sort menu. So Figma is rem remembering now. And I think stateful prototypes are really cool and they were tough to do before, but I think now we can do them uh, as I'm showing here. So we are still further and further approaching game levels of fidelity, but in a prototype at very early stages with very little uh, time investment. And so for the final demo in today's um, in today's sort of prototyping demos, let's do uh, the last thing, which is bring it back to the game. So now we want to add the ability, as all players should be able to do, is to leave the menus and go back to the game that they've been enjoying so far. We're going to take all of the prototyping stuff we've built so far and connect it back to the game screen. So what we'll do here is select all of our screens. Uh, we don't have to select the sorting screen because the player can't directly go from the game into the sort menu. They kind of have to go through this layer of the UI first. So we don't have to connect the sort menu back to the game, right? We just have to do this layer. And then that gives the pathway for things that are further on. Um, right. So again, we're just going to make a bulk prototyping connection. We select all of the frames. Uh, it's also important to note that we're not selecting a section here the inventory section, because we don't need the inventory to be stateful or remember where it was when you come back into it from the game screen. So that's the functionality we only need for the sorting benefit, not otherwise. So we're just selecting the frames directly. Um, I'll switch back to prototype mode. And from these selected frames, I'm going to drag a bulk prototyping noodle out. 
this is a little tricky. I have to kind of play around with it. But there we go. There's a bulk prototyping noodle connected to the game screen. And the interaction details will make it uh, go out with the options key. That's the menu key on your controller. It's a very standard interaction to have the menu key bring up and then dismiss the game menus. And then from the game screen, we're going to connect the menu key. Uh, sorry, the from the game screen, we're going to connect to the first place in the inventory prototype and have this be also uh, have this also work with the option key. So I'll play this prototype now. Press the menu key to open the game or open the game menu. Navigate your tabs, navigate your inventory, maybe sort a few things. Go look at your skills, maybe unlock a few new ones. Scroll your quests, get to know what you're doing next and go back to the game. Um, we've completed what is a uh, pretty realistic fidelity for what you would expect for, from a game um, in Figma. And I think this is the power of plugins and the power of bulk prototyping workflows in general is like doing this individually by hand for something of this level of complexity would be impossible. You would make so many mistakes or just forget something. We're all human. Um, but having an automated tool that you know will work predictably, that doesn't make mistakes, that's tailored to your workflow really helps in just the amount of time it saves and the amount of QA it cuts for you as the game designer or game UX designer. So um, I'm pretty happy with uh, like what I've been able to show you today and I hope it was helpful. Um, one last thing I do wanna call out is I do wanna bring that element back of uh, that element of adjusting your starting position a bit. So when you think of this prototype, this one noodle, right? Connects the game screen to the inventory but it could also connect to the skills tree or even the quests. So if you're if you're thinking of manipulating starting position, it's just very easy with prototypes. You can just drag the arrow to whatever starting tab you want. Let's say I wanna start on quests always. And so now I will start on quests always. And that's how easy it can be to manipulate some of these characteristics of game UI when you've got a, a prototype like this. So yeah, thank you so much. Um, I really enjoyed being able to demo these things and I really enjoyed sharing Prototyper with you and some of the other game UX, UX things that I've learned over the last two years or so. Um, we are open for questions now. Um, and if you'd like to keep in touch with me, you know, you can follow me on Twitter. If we don't get to all the questions here, feel free to ask me those questions on Twitter. And um, yeah, I'll hand it back to you, Jake. Oh my goodness. Can we get some hype in the chat? That was incredible. I, I work here and I'm learning things about our product from this. Um, thank you so much. Yeah, let's uh, let's go in with the hype here. Um, I'm going to share my screen. We'll go back to this. Okay, so we only have 15 minutes here, but uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna prioritize some of the Q and A we've gotten based on. It looks like there's some themes. So uh, the first theme is about like breaking into the industry. And so I've got like a question from Austin. It looks like Melinda and there's another anonymous person kind of asking the same thing, but um, we'll start with uh, Austin's uh, wording here. So do you have any tips for people trying to transition from UX design for web apps um, to game UX and breaking into that scene? And they reference something called AAA experience. Is that something you're familiar with? Oh yeah, um, AAA is just like just the the level of game development. I guess uh, I might be wrong on that. Sorry, but there's no formal definition. Uh, yeah. I, yeah, I can talk a little bit about this. Um, so there's a couple of things that people, when they're hiring in games, have to translate for when you're coming for web, right? For one of those things is what we talked about today. Like, do you get what focus-based navigation is? Do you, can you prototype for that? Or can you design for it effectively? Um, as easy as you can make it for them to see that the experiences you already have can translate well to games. Uh, that's pretty much the key. That and go to the networking events. So a, a practical example of how to translate your existing development experience or design experience is take a crack at redesigning a suboptimal flow for a game. Um, put that on your portfolio. As long as you design it in a way that actually makes the user's job easy and you acknowledge maybe some of the development constraints around it, right? Talk to 
some people who work in game dev, if you can, and just ask them questions like, hey, what problems do you see with this? Um, you can make a case for yourself because that's essentially what I did. I came from mobile, but I, I redesigned the game and I did so thoughtfully and I learned a lot in the process. So I showed how I'd gone about designing the game and how I tackled some very specific game UX things. Uh, but I'm happy to chat about this more like later as well. Yeah. Um, I guess coming off of that, an anonymous attendee has a very like kind of similar question. Uh, do you, but do you need to be an avid gamer to get into game UX design? Um, because they are not, but they're really interested in it and are a little bored of designing for web and mobile. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Um, so no, the answer is no, you don't actually have to play games or even enjoy games to design for games. Uh, I think it would be really weird if everybody who designed for games played games all the time, like we would become very narrow minded as an industry. Uh, and so, um, diversity of experiences is, is helpful in a lot and really your personal preference about games doesn't matter. It's just, are you good at designing for games? Do you have all the skills you need to design for games? If the answer to that question is yes, yeah, go, go for it. You will break it in the industry. I'd also add on that, like, if you're like interested in game controllers and stuff too, you can actually like program for those like uh, uh, tools on the web. And that's been like fun. Like I've played with that a little bit too. So that could be an interesting way to kind of like start to introduce some of these concepts um, as you're thinking about, as you're thinking about that. Awesome. Um, it looks like another kind of theme here is, well, actually let's start with Daniel's question. Um, Daniel's wondering how does designing for a global audience change your approach to UI design? Oh man, that's a good one. I think the, the wider, the broader your audience, the less assumptions you can make. Do you think the people will understand the English text you're writing in your game? No, maybe not. So translate it. Like that's a very, that, perhaps that's a cop-out example, right? But that's a very relevant one. It's, it's just so you can't make any assumptions. At some point, you can't even assume that the player you're designing for is familiar with a controller. Like there are some markets where literally everybody only uses like phones. I think it's maybe Japan or something like it's a phone first country. And so if you're designing a cross-platform game that's primarily designed around controller navigation and transfer some of those concepts to mobile, you might want to fact check like whether your players will understand those navigation patterns. So I think the more global your audience, the more representation you need in your teams, either through, you can gain this representation by hiring people from different countries, right? But you can also gain it through having a UX research team that is able to conduct research tests across these different audiences and have enough of a cultural background, uh, either through lived experience or through, um, you know, like learning it themselves. So yeah, like that's pretty important for games to have like representation and stuff for these global audiences. But yeah, don't make any assumptions. Otherwise, it, it's just you're going to shoot yourself in the foot. Yeah, that, that's great advice in general. Um, cool, so here's another topic. We got two questions that are kind of revolving around this. I'm gonna uh, ask the one that uh, Sean asked, um, but Paulina's question is related to this as well. And it's kind of like, a, give us the kind of behind the scenes on, um, on, on this aspect of game UI. So when you have a navigational priority for like a UI, mm -hmm. um, Presumably, especially if like purchases are involved, there's some sort of like agreements or something. So there's Sean's question is like, when it comes to that navigational priority for purchase promotions, is there like an application of ethics when you're designing that and or required from like a business perspective? Do you have any experience with like with with that? I can't speak to the Perhaps like in terms of the legality of it, I don't mm -hmm. know, right? Because I've never worked on that part of games. I've not yeah. designed stores or purchase screens. But just I think generally in terms of UX ethics, um, don't lock the player. Like there's a few mm -hmm. things to avoid. Don't create a dark pattern. Like if you yeah. subscribe to something, make sure it's easy to unsubscribe. If you buy something and you're allowed to refund it, communicate that clearly. But if you're yeah. not allowed to refund it, that's fine. Like. Yeah. The game is a business at the end of the day, and it can make these decisions. Um, I think the only thing is 
intentional obfuscation of information to make it harder mm -hmm. to give, like to make it harder to go back on decisions. That kind of stuff feels uh, like it would violate a lot of the ethics things like we talk about in the UX. But other than that, I think games are businesses at the end of the day. So, you know, they should be allowed to make these decisions just so long as they're not making things difficult for the player intentionally. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so Sebastian is wondering, do you absolutely need the middle frame for that scrolling interaction? Thank you so much. This has been great. Uh, you don't. I mean, you, I guess you can have, for any interaction, you need two states of before and after. You can add as many steps as you want in the middle. So for that scrolling prototype, I could have just made two frames, had the other frame scroll all the way to the end of the list. Um, the reason we I added the middle frame is because users typically don't scroll like that. They will scroll and pause and scroll and pause and scroll and pause unless they already know where to go. Then they'll just scroll right to that spot, right? Got it. Yeah. Um, I, and also, I was curious when you were showing me that, is there some way to like scroll and navigate like down that list of rectangles? Uh, yeah, you can do that. Is um, it really complicated? Not really. I guess it's 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 way more frames, yes, because you have yeah. to kind of do each frame. But um, what you would do is when you hit the bottom of the list, you, when when you hit the last item in the current visible set of items, you essentially yeah. trigger the scroll transition at that point, right? Bring in a fresh list of items and then keep scrolling. So yeah, it's it's more tricky for sure, but you can do both if you wanted. Coming from just like, like my experience as a software engineer is like exclusively like standard point and click web stuff. The closest thing we get to this is like tab order for accessibility, yeah. you know, uh, which is a lot different, uh, um, but kind oh, of similar. That's a good yeah. point, actually. I should mention that this focus-based navigation stuff isn't exclusive to games. I mean, Apple TV yeah. and other places do it, but yep. also the web, the web has, um, screen readers right and that's yep. boom it's like focus-based navigation through and through so even if you are a web designer this stuff might be good to pay attention to and like uh learn more about to sharpen up accessibility skills yep um an anonymous attendee wants to know how did you create wireframes like this before your plugin was it just manually <laughs> yes i would do this by hand and it would take hours uh like my team knows my pain so so well yeah it was it was nuts I think I was making a prototype for one of the features we were working on. And after that prototype, I was like, I'm done. I'm never doing this by hand again. I would rather code something. Um, so that was about two years ago. I hit my breaking point. Uh, I can imagine. I haven't spent a bunch of time with prototypes, so I've never really, I've been aware of how complicated it can get. I've seen screenshots, yeah. but I've never actually had to go through that effort. Um, Paulina wants to know, do you have a YouTube series? I guess we all do. There was a lot of hype in the chat, like while you were going about how helpful this is and how an hour is too short. So do you have any other content online? No, I don't um, right now. I guess when this goes to YouTube, this will be yeah. uh, that. Um, and I wasn't planning on making any more sort of public facing videos around this, at least not right now. But I did want to call out in chat. So what I did before this talk was I made a copy of all the design exercises or prototyping exercises I did today. Um, and I, I think we'll post it in the chat soon. But if you want, when this goes on YouTube, you can make a copy of that file and then do the same things that I'm doing alongside the video. So it will get you caught up um, on whatever I'm doing on screen. Because I know I went through a few things fast. I didn't call out every shortcut I used or every single thing I did. Right. So if you're a beginner yeah. who's getting caught up, uh, watching the YouTube video and then doing the exercises yourself will be, uh, your way to sort of get caught up really fast. Um, I wanted to ask this question selfishly. So plugin development is really exciting and we've got a community on the friends of Figma discord, get the developer role. If you're interested in plugin development, um, how has your experience been building plugins? Uh, we, we we had like one question in the chat about like what languages you need to know, and I responded that you know it's JavaScript and and like web uh, web dev, so HTML and CSS. How is how has that been for you building plugins? So plugin development has been pretty fantastic. Like I think there was a learning curve in the beginning, right? With with all new things, there was a learning curve in the beginning. Yeah. 
Um, but I think for Figma plugin development, that hump is pretty short. Um, the docs I particularly appreciated because it kind of lets you bootstrap everything. Yeah. I will say the most difficult thing for me was starting plugin development was um, I, I come from a development background. So some of these things are already familiar, but I, I think you want to familiarize yourself with the basics of logic in a language. So if you're, if you're particularly targeting Figma, then you want to start learning JavaScript, learn some of the basic programming concepts about how do you control logic? How do you run loops? How do you do flow? Um, that kind of stuff. Um, but for Figma specifically, one framework that I cannot call out enough is uh, the Create Figma plugin framework. And I use this for every single plugin I make. It helps me bootstrap the plugin. If I'm making a Figma widget or a specific kind of plugin, it has yep. templates for that. So I just put the link in chat, but like this is absolutely fantastic. Yeah. It'll, it'll save you all this time that you have to set up with the compiling and compilation pipeline which is just a nightmare for me personally. Yeah. Like I don't understand compilers or anything, so. Um, well, cool. Well, we're almost at time. Uh, the questions we didn't get to, sorry we ran out of time, but join the Discord. And that's a great place for all sorts of Figma questions. And specifically, if you're interested in plugins and widgets, that's a great place to do it. Um, Ashray, what do you have to plug before we go? Oh, um, not much actually. Uh, check out Prototyper. Uh, I think we posted the link here, but it'll also be uh, in the discord. Yeah. Check out prototyper, the plugin, um, check out the community file, uh, and see if you'd like to like, you know, um, play around with that now, but also later when the YouTube video comes out. And if you want to chat with me, uh, Twitter is a good place. You can also find me on the Figma discord, but Twitter, I think I prefer over discord. Um, so yeah, yeah find me there. If you have more questions or you just want to talk more games or design. Amazing. Well, Reminder to everyone, I know this comes up in the chat every time, future live streams you can uh, find at figma.com slash events, and our YouTube channel is going to hold this recording, uh, uh, and so we'll have that up. If you have any suggestions or ideas uh, for future live streams, reach out to communityfigma.com. I just want to say thanks so much again, Ashray. This has been phenomenal. This was my first time hosting, so I'm super stoked on that, uh, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll see you all on the net. Yeah. Have a good one, guys. Thank you Thanks so much. Thanks so much, for everyone. Bye-bye.